hello again, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I am Nurse Mo, and I'm so happy that you're here with me today. Today, we're diving into mental health, talking about bipolar disorder. Before we do that, I want to take a minute to acknowledge my listeners, and this one goes out to an individual who uses the screen name of Gal from Ipanema. And this person says, your podcast is an integral part of my study routine. I decided to explore a case study while cleaning the kitchen, and wow. Although I'm in my second semester of nursing school, understanding and explaining fundamental principles still requires concerted effort and is not yet second nature. These case studies are delightful and powerful immersions into the real world setting, but experienced from the comforts of home. They masterfully marry the rudimentary with the advanced, bringing together vital principles one must master to feel confident and think critically and effectively in the clinical setting. I was blown away by the way you made me go from feeling inept too empowered, confirming what my suspicions were regarding Bob and Kim's evolving conditions and readjusting my thinking when I was not quite on the right path. These studies are painstakingly crafted for one's enrichment and patient safety. The three case studies leave one anxious for more. So thank you so much for submitting that review. These case studies were in my premium podcast study sesh, which I will link to in the episode notes. So thank you so much, Gal from Ipanema. That song, The Girl from Ipanema Goes Walking, is one of my favorite songs, and I'm sorry you guys all had to hear me sing for that. Okay, so today we're diving into mental health, talking about bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is a mental health condition characterized by alternating episodes of emotional highs and lows. The occurrence of these extreme mood swings is variable. Some individuals experience them multiple times a year, while others have more rare occurrences. Though a lifelong condition with no cure, bipolar disorder can be managed with proper treatment. Now, the exact cause of bipolar disorder is not known, but it is thought to be a consequence of genetics, environment, altered brain chemistry, and even altered brain structure. Additionally, some studies suggest that bipolar disorder may be linked to dysregulation of the immune system as serum inflammation markers are increased in individuals with the disorder. Individuals most at risk for bipolar disorder are those with a family history. A child born to a parent with bipolar disorder has a 10 to 25% risk of also having the condition. Additionally, highly stressful events such as trauma or death of a family member can increase the risk of bipolar disorder, as can drug and alcohol abuse. Interestingly, advanced Paternal age, so on the father's side, advanced paternal age of 45 years and older is shown to be related to higher incidences of bipolar disorder in their offspring. There is an equal risk between males and females, with the average age of onset being 18. In addition to bipolar disorder, many individuals also have a concurrent anxiety disorder, substance use disorder, or ADHD. So let's talk through some key terms so we're both talking the same talk. So the first one is major depressive episode. This is a period of at least two weeks where the individual experiences at least five symptoms of depression, such as sleeping more than usual, difficulty concentrating, a loss of interest in things they once found enjoyable, and recurrent thoughts of suicide or death. And we'll talk about more detail about this further on. A manic episode is a period of at least seven days characterized by feelings of euphoria or irritability for most of the day each day, feelings of having more energy than usual, and at least three characteristics of mania, such as increased activity, decreased need for sleep, and racing thoughts. We'll also talk a little bit more about manic episodes in a bit. And then a hypomanic episode 
this is a less severe form of a manic episode. It's shorter in duration than a manic episode generally. It lasts about four days and does not disrupt daily functioning in the way a manic episode does. So let's talk briefly about the types of bipolar disorder. There are two types. Bipolar 1 disorder, also referred to as BD1, is present when there is a history of one or more manic episodes with or without any episodes of depression. So that's bipolar 1 disorder. Bipolar 2 disorder, or BD2, is present when the individual has recent episodes of major depression along with at least one hypomanic episode. This individual has never experienced a full manic episode. So bipolar disorder is often misdiagnosed as depression, cyclothymic disorder, or borderline personality disorder due to some similarities between these conditions. This can lead to a delay in starting the appropriate treatment. So some key differences to note are these. So bipolar disorder versus depression. Because more than half of patients with bipolar disorder initially experience a depressive episode, this leads to a high incidence of individuals being misdiagnosed with depression. The individual with bipolar disorder will have a manic or hypomanic episode at some point, whereas an individual with depression will not. Now, bipolar disorder versus cyclothymic disorder. Cyclothymic disorder involves elevated mood episodes that don't quite meet the criteria for hypomania, as well as depressive episodes that don't quite meet the criteria for a major depressive episode. And then bipolar disorder versus borderline personality disorder. Bipolar disorder patients experience varying episodes of depression and elation or mania, while those with borderline personality disorder experience varying episodes of depression and rage. Additionally, Borderline personality disorder mood shifts tend to be more rapid. We're looking at hours to days, while bipolar disorder episodes are of longer duration. So there are definitely serious consequences and complications of bipolar disorder. The suicide risk is 20 to 30% greater in patients with bipolar disorder compared to those in the standard population. And there's also risk for injury during manic episodes due to decreased inhibition. These patients also have insomnia, poor nutrition, increased risk of cardiovascular disease and hypertension, increased risk of obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. Additionally, additionally, patients with bipolar disorder are more likely to be involved in violence both as victims and perpetrators. So now that you have a pretty solid background understanding of bipolar disorder, let's go through it using the straight A nursing latte method. So we'll start with the letter L. How does the patient with bipolar disorder look? What do you notice about them? What do they state as their chief complaints? So patients with bipolar disorder will typically display extreme mood swings, though how quickly they shift from highs to lows will vary based on each individual. The signs and symptoms of mania and hypomania are similar, with mania being more severe, lasting longer, and causing greater disruption to daily life. These include at least three of the common signs, and these are talking more than usual or talking faster than usual, increased physical activity or working on multiple projects or tasks simultaneously, a decreased need for sleep, reckless behavior such as overspending, risky sexual encounters, or driving dangerously, racing thoughts or changing topics when speaking, being easily distracted, feelings of increased self-esteem, an exaggerated sense of well-being, and increased libido and increased flirtation. 
Now, manic episodes are further characterized by severely increased grandiosity and self-confidence and can include psychotic features such as disorganized thinking, hallucinations, and false beliefs. The patient will also show at least five signs of major depressive episode, and these include difficulty focusing or concentrating, being very indecisive, more or less sleep than usual, more or less appetite than usual, weight gain and weight loss can occur, restlessness, slowed speech, slower movement than usual, increased fatigue, loss of interest in things they once enjoyed, significant feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and even despair, feeling guilt or worthlessness, poor hygiene, disorganized thinking, hallucinations, and false beliefs, and recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. Note that individuals with bipolar disorder may also exhibit manipulative behavior. This may help them feel more secure as the manipulation provides a sense of control in unfamiliar situations. So now let's talk about the letter A. How do you assess the patient with bipolar disorder? One of the most important things you can assess is suicidal ideation and thoughts of self-harm. If present, this patient is at high risk for self-harm and requires a higher level of monitoring and intervention. You'll also assess frequency and intensity of manic and hypomanic symptoms, as well as the depressive symptoms. Assess the patient and surroundings for safety issues. Patients are at high risk for injury to self and others during manic episodes and at risk for self-harm during depressive episodes. You would be surprised what just normal everyday items in a patient's room could be risk for harm. I recently had to do a skills training, and one of the trainings was about this, and pretty much everything in the room was at risk for being an agent of self-harm, so it really made me look at things in a different way. You want to weigh the patient and assess nutritional status as loss of appetite and weight loss are common. Ask the patient about drug and alcohol use and assess the caregiver for caregiver burnout. Caring for a patient with bipolar disorder may involve considerable burdens and stress. You also want to assess the patient for comorbid health or psychiatric issues Remember, many patients with bipolar disorder also have a concurrent anxiety disorder, substance use disorder, and ADHD. Nurse Mo here. Are you tired of sitting at your desk studying for exams or the NCLEX? What would it feel like to get a bit of your life back so you could get up from your desk, go for a run, do things around the house? take care of errands, or even just take the dog out for a walk. Bet you can't, because you need to study. Or can you? With Study Sesh, you will use auditory formats to the max to accelerate your learning, free yourself from your desk, and get your life back. Study Sesh is more than just a podcast. It's a form of highly effective auditory learning that is so much more than listening. Study Sesh involves thinking, analyzing, and even responding. This keeps your brain highly engaged in a way that doesn't involve reading or staring at a screen. Stephanie says, the audio flashcards are a total game changer. I am hooked. And Amy says, it forces me to use my recall of information and critical thinking without the option of choosing from four answers. The drills are brilliant, again, forcing me to fully understand the information. And Kara says, I thought I loved the regular Straight A Nursing podcast, but Study Sesh is on a whole other level. Combined, they provide excellent study material, and I feel like I've struck audiovisual learning gold. Study Sesh includes over 100 study sessions in four formats. Most are the highly popular pod quizzes, and the others are in case study format, power hours, and drills. Plus, more in-depth topics come with study guides. 
Want to free yourself from your desk while you study for exams or the NCLEX? Enroll in Study Sesh today. Go to straightanursingstudent.com forward slash study dash sesh to learn more. That's straightanursingstudent.com forward slash study dash sesh. I can't wait to be your study buddy. So the next letter in the latte method is a T. What tests will be ordered? So the physician may conduct or order specific assessments and diagnostics for the patient to rule out other medical conditions that could be causing the symptoms. And this, of course, will vary on each individual. The main diagnostic tool for bipolar disorder is psychiatric evaluation. This will include observation of the patient, discussion with the patient regarding their feelings, behaviors, and thoughts. A commonly used tool is the Mood Disorder Questionnaire, or MDQ. This is a 13-item questionnaire that has shown to have reliable sensitivity and specificity for a diagnosis of bipolar disorder when utilized with psychiatric evaluation. The patient may be asked to record their mood and sleep patterns as part of their initial evaluation as well as throughout treatment. So let's talk about treatment next. That's the next letter in the latte method. Your key nursing interventions or treatments are to provide an environment of safety for your patient and for yourself, and you also want to avoid escalating behavior. In addition to maintaining a low stimulus environment, you'll also want to ensure there are no dangerous objects in the room. This includes anything your patient could use to harm you or themselves. This can be something as simple as the tray that the food comes on. Patients who are on safety precautions will not get a plastic tray or plastic plates. They'll get a paper tray and paper plates. They will not get knives. (laughs) They will have to make do, I, I think, with just spoons to eat. You will want to take everything away from the bedside that could be used as a weapon. Even bags, even the biohazard containment bag will need to be removed from the room because that could be an asphyxiation tool. So you have to look at your patient rooms in a completely different light from that from that standpoint of patient safety. Other important nursing interventions are to use therapeutic communication to validate the patient's feelings if they become anxious, aggressive, or agitated. You should remain very calm when speaking. Anxious patients may benefit from physical activity, such as going for a walk through the halls. Offer restless patients easy-to-consume snacks, like finger foods. You also want to set limits for patients who display manipulative behavior by explaining limits and consequences. Do not engage in bargaining as this validates the manipulative behavior. Conversely, give positive reinforcement when the patient exhibits non-manipulative behavior. Some patients will require the use of behavior contracts. These are signed documents outlining the specific behaviors to avoid and consequences of noncompliance. Patients with bipolar disorder will likely receive therapy from a psychiatrist. This can include cognitive behavioral therapy. This form of therapy teaches strategies for coping with stress, helps patients identify their negative beliefs and behaviors, and teaches them to recognize their triggers and replace negative beliefs and behaviors with positive ones. They may also get interpersonal and social rhythm therapy, IPSRT, interpersonal and social rhythm therapy. This form of therapy helps the individual recognize and regulate daily routines and social rhythms and includes interpersonal therapy to help them improve their relationships. It also uses sleep-wake regulation as a way to treat disruption of the circadian rhythm that can be common in bipolar disorder. Group therapy may also be utilized. Support groups and group counseling help patients gain perspective and form positive connections with others. And then there's family therapy. Addressing the complex issues families face when dealing with bipolar disorder has shown to reduce relapse rate. And then, of course, substance abuse treatment as needed. Bipolar disorder may be more difficult to treat in patients with concurrent substance abuse disorder, so it's always a good idea to address this as well. 
Now, electroconvulsive therapy may be utilized in cases where the disorder is resistant to pharmacologic therapy or the patient is unable to take the medication. This would be cases such as pregnancy or high suicide risk. This treatment involves passing low levels of electricity through the brain to induce brief seizures that can change the brain chemistry to reduce or reverse bipolar disorder symptoms. If you want to learn more about electroconvulsive therapy, I've got you covered in an episode entirely dedicated to that topic. You can explore that in episode 142. And for some patients, hospitalization may be required if they are suicidal or exhibiting dangerous behaviors. Now let's talk about medications. Pharmacologic treatment often requires at least two medications and will typically involve trial and error to find the right combination with side effects that are tolerable for the patient. So mood stabilizers such as lithium are considered the most effective treatment for bipolar disorder. But lithium does have a narrow therapeutic window with high toxicity risk. Signs of lithium toxicity include ringing in the ears, diarrhea, ataxia, and vomiting. The patient on lithium will require periodic blood draws to assess their level of lithium in the bloodstream and may also have renal and thyroid function monitored as lithium can adversely affect both. Other mood stabilizers commonly used for bipolar disorder are lamotrigine and carbamazepine. Second-generation atypical antipsychotics such as olanzapine, brand name Zyprexa, and quetiapine, brand name Seroquel, may also be used. Common adverse effects of these medications are weight gain, hyperglycemia, dyslipidemia, sedation, and extra pyramidal symptoms such as tardive dyskinesia. A key benefit of these medications is that some have a long-acting injectable form, which makes adherence more likely in some individuals. Antidepressants such as sertraline, brand name Zoloft, and fluoxetine, brand name Prozac, are also commonly used in combination with a mood stabilizer or a typical antipsychotic. Note that antidepressants are not approved for monotherapy as their use in patients with bipolar disorder can lead to rapid cycling between manic and depressive states. Additionally, antidepressants can cause increased suicidal ideation, especially in children and adolescents. Patients taking antidepressants must be closely monitored until the prescribing physician is aware of how the medication affects the individual. Benzodiazepines such as lorazepam, brand name Ativan, may be used for short-term treatment of insomnia associated with bipolar disorder, but they are highly addictive. Anticonvulsants may be utilized during manic episodes by calming hyperactivity in the brain. Commonly used anticonvulsants are valproic acid, brand name Depakote, and topiramate, brand name Topamax. So let's talk a bit about the barriers to pharmacologic treatment. Some key barriers to effective pharmacologic treatment of bipolar disorder are non-adherence to the regimen, the side effects, which can be very significant, real or imagined, and the stigma of being on psych medications, as well as fear of dependence, financial issues, and even straight-up denial about the diagnosis. Additionally, when patients with bipolar disorder have a comorbid disorder, such as another psych disorder or a substance use disorder, compliance with medications may be more challenging. In some cases, once monthly injections of IM medication like aripiprazole, brand name Abilify, may prove to be especially beneficial. So the final letter in the LATTE method is an E for education. How do we educate the patient and the family? Some key teaching points for bipolar disorder are, you always want to make sure the patient and the family understand that some medications are going to take weeks or months to take full effect. And 
the specific drug regimen may need to be tweaked until the best combination of medications for that patient can be determined. You also want to teach patients to continue with their medications even when they start to feel better. Teach your patient to eat meals at regular times, avoid caffeine, and keep to a consistent sleep schedule. Teach your patients to monitor for weight loss or weight gain and that medications may cause weight gain. Teach them how to monitor for BD symptoms, bipolar disorder symptoms. Teach family members to monitor the patient for symptoms as well and to know when to seek medical and psychiatric help. You should also provide support resources such as the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, which has a crisis line. I will include a link to that in the episode notes. And then, of course, there's always going to be teaching about the specific medications. So if your patient is taking lithium, teach them to monitor for the signs of toxicity and to maintain adequate hydration as well as adequate dietary sodium intake. Additionally, they should notify their MD immediately if they become pregnant or are trying to become pregnant. If your patient is taking anticonvulsants, teach them to report a rash bleeding, bruising, fever, dark urine, or yellowing skin and eyes, as these are signs of anticonvulsant hypersensitivity syndrome. And then if your patient is taking antipsychotics, teach them that their skin will be more sensitive to the sun, so they should wear sunscreen and protective clothing to avoid burns. They should know to report signs of liver damage, such as bleeding and bruising, dark urine, pale stools, and yellowing of the skin and eyes. Sipping water or chewing sugar-free gum can help with dry mouth symptoms, and they should stand up slowly to prevent orthostatic hypotension. Patients taking antipsychotics should immediately notify their physician and psychiatrist if they become pregnant. So I hope you found this review of bipolar disorder helpful. If so, you will love our other mental health episodes. I will provide a link to those in the episode notes. So coming up, we have got a lot of bonus episodes coming your way. To make sure you don't miss a single one, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. So however your podcast player does it, it may be a subscribe button, it may be follow, whatever it is, make sure you're following or subscribed so that the bonus episodes show up for you like magic when they appear. So the next one will be coming up very, very soon. And I'm going to be talking to those of you who think you might be too old for nursing school. Guess what? You're not. So I will see you in a couple of days to talk about that. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing. Hey, I'm not perfect. So major depressive disorder. Nope, it's major depressive episode. Back up. Lost of, lost, nope, lost, 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 lost. A cyclo, cyclo, how do you say that? Gotta look that one up. While bipolar personality, nope, by, uh, 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 deep breaths, Mo, deep breaths, you got this. Patients with border, nope, God, why can't I keep those two straight? Patients with bipolar disorder are more likely to involve, <sighs> I can't talk today. So there are some barriers to, barriers, oh my goodness, some key barriers to effective, why can't I say barriers? What's wrong with me? Some key barriers to effective pharmacologic treatment. Oh my God, I'm never going to get past this part. In some cases, long-term medications such as once monthly IM injection, oh my God, this has been a long day, girlfriend. You always want to make sure the pet. Make sure the people, the people, the people, hello, the people.